on this episode of On Cam Ready. As a guest on the show, the media doesn't owe you anything. They owe you nothing. People have a misconception that most people on TV are getting paid, and it's not true. Most are not getting paid. These TV insiders, as you can hear, are going to be busting some myths. They're going to help you become more on camera ready online and on television. Hi, I'm Jamie Maglietta, a TV news veteran with over 20 years experience, and this is On Cam Ready. On Cam Ready is a video first podcast, meaning it's posting here on YouTube before it posts on the podcasting platforms. If you're listening on a podcasting platform right now, be sure to check out the YouTube version. And if you're on YouTube, I always appreciate you subscribing. So be sure to do that and like the video. I have really been putting all my effort into making this all about you. If you're a professional looking to be attracting the media and securing earned media, Every guest that we bring on is meant to help you, guide you, and give you insider knowledge that you can only get really right here. I also wanted to let you know that all of my podcasting efforts are supported through collaborations and affiliations. So instead of ads right now, I will be plugging the brands I'm working with. My top is StyleWe. I have a link in my bio if you would like a discount off their clothes. I'm also working with a recording platform. So if you are looking to launch your podcast, be sure to check out my platform of choice. And you know, speaking of podcasting, if you have an idea for a show, download my PDF. It is a roadmap to podcasting. My goal is to help you shape your idea into a podcasting show. And if you need help, reach out. I offer um, consulting work. Now let's get to the episode. Today we're talking to Wendy Goresco and Amelia Glenhill. Wendy Goresco and Amelia are with the Goresco Group. I met Wendy on LinkedIn. She has so much experience, over 12 years at CNN and 20 plus years in public relations. Amelia, her daughter, yes, it's a mother-daughter duo. Amelia, her daughter, is the media matchmaker. And in this episode, she shares some do's and don'ts on what television guests should and shouldn't do if they want to secure a callback. Now, all three of us are not on-camera personalities. I've been a producer most of my career, if not all. And, you know, our conversation ran a little long. So we recorded this in September and I wound up editing it a little bit due to time. But I know you're going to gain so much from it. And I do hope that you'll reach out and let me know what you think of the valuable tips that we're offering. And if you have any questions and really want us to dig into some advice that you can't seem to locate online, reach out, email me at jamie at oncamready.com. Now, here's our conversation. Amelia and Wendy, thank you so much for joining us. I really wanted to start off with your journey and the fact that the two of you work together. So Wendy, why don't you start by just sharing us, sharing a little bit about who you are, how you came from CNN, launched your business, and then brought your daughter in. Okay. Well, my journey, I wish I could say it had all been planned out, but it was all crazy circumstances that led to all this. Um, I had been in advertising for 10 years, came home to Atlanta to write the great American novel and took a temp job where I answered the phones in the guest booking department at CNN for a week. And I liked them. They liked me. And we ended up, um, one of the bookers was going on maternity leave and they said, can you fill in for her? And I thought, I've never done this in my life, but okay. <laughs> so I filled in for her and she didn't come back. So I got her job, which I don't even think I would have gotten an interview, you know, otherwise. So I mean, especially looking at your background, I mean, you were in advertising. So I also love that about your, your background, advertising, working at the Coke, you had Coke, you were working on brands. And then all of a sudden you're the director of guest booking for like over a decade. <laughs> so yeah. And it was so really cool, the timing of it, because when I first started at CNN, nobody knew what CNN was. I would call and say, Hey, can you come on CNN? And they go, is that a bank? What is that? <laughs> and then after the Gulf War, those same people would get out of a meeting to take my call. So it was a mm -hmm. fun little arc there. 
<laughs> and then after CNN, you decided to launch your own business. So why don't you tell yeah. us about that? Well, again, it was an, an accidental series of things that happened. Um, 9-11 happened. My mother was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And I looked at everything on my plate. The only thing I could get rid of was CNN. So I went to my boss and said, what do I do? I have to have the layoff package that's happening because of the merger with Time Warner. And she got it for me. So this business just sort of grew accidentally. And by the time the CNN check stopped coming, I had clients and I've been doing it ever since. And you brought your daughter in. Amelia, why don't you tell us about that one? So this was another happy accident um, that occurred about three weeks before my wedding in December of 2021. I was in a fashion styling job that I did not like, and I was trying to stick it out for a year. I was seven months in. I was really ready to give up. And unfortunately, and fortunately, uh, Wendy lost her managing director at the same time. And so we both agreed that I would come on as an assistant and help out around the company and I very quickly learned that I was way better than an assistant and I climbed the ladder very quickly. Amelia, why don't you tell us more about what you do with News of the Day? News of the Day is the headlines that you see first thing in the morning. Wendy and I consume so much media throughout the day. We are flipping through the news channels all day, every day, trying to align the right news stories with the right clients to highlight their expertise and get them the best earned media placements I can. You know, having produced reliable sources on CNN, I was constantly consuming cable. So I can understand a little bit about what you might be doing all day, you know, looking at the guests, seeing how they look on TV, seeing the topics that are being covered, analyzing all the details that go into it. When you're looking at so much TV and reading so much news, how do you think that that really helps your clients stand out when pitching them to the press? Well, I think I think we all think like producers. We, we try to make the producer's job easier. And the quickest way to get coverage for our clients is to work them into something that producers already have on their rundown and they just need to fill it with the guests. So we look at it in terms of how can our clients help move that story forward or put it in context for the audience? Um, and it's, it's really just matchmaking. Yeah. And that's what I loved when we were, you know, talking ahead of time about how Amelia is like the matchmaker helping put people together. It really made me think of a conversation I had about the relationship building that needs to go in. So if, if you're listening and you want to be on camera and you're looking for ways to connect with the press, it's it's not just about, you know, pitching the stories that make the most sense to you. It's also trying to figure out, as Wendy's saying, what they're covering and how you can benefit them and building a relationship with those producers and reporters and writers so that they have you at the forefront of their mind when there is something going on. Um, and so you, you two are the, the matchmakers. You're helping the guests connect with the media and get themselves on TV. And I think that that's where we want to start this conversation to help everyone who's looking to become more on cam ready. So when you're prepping people, um, who are landing opportunities on TV. You know, Amelia, what are three things that the two of you work with them on to make sure that when they are on TV, they're nailing it? I would say their wardrobe would be number one, making sure that they weren't wearing any crazy patterns or have any funky things that would distract from what they were saying. No chunky jewelry. And that would be my first because the viewers are going to be looking at them, but they also need to be listening to them. Wendy, what other points would you make? Well, I think you have to know who you're going to be talking to. It's really important. There's some anchors that want to have a lighter conversation where you can, you know, be sort of folksy and whatever. And others are just, they want to get right to the point and be really serious. So you have to be prepared for that and understand the flow of the show, the personality of the show so that you can fit in the best way possible. 
Um, and I think for your content, you kind of never know what the anchor is going to ask. So you want to go in with your three best points ready to just come out no matter what the question is and don't save anything for later. I have so many clients that will come off the set and say, oh, I never got a chance to say my best thing. Say it first. So you make sure you get it out there. So. You know, I, that's a really good point. So I have pageant training and I bring this up because they're really, really good at training people how to interview in front of a panel. And what I learned from that, I felt like I could always apply when I was working with a reporter or an anchor, because you want to really think about all the things you want to say and finding ways to weave them in by mm -hmm. thinking about what are the questions these yes. people could ask by thinking about what are the questions these people could ask and how can I get to the points I want, right? And one of the things I always say is, yeah, make sure you fit it in, but also know your segues, you know, know how to segue to those points, right? Um, you know, we talked about the set, but now that more people are, are interviewing from home, it, it also opens up the opportunity for people to be more themselves. And I was listening to this one media trainer suggest like, if you're a biker, you should look like a biker. If you're a, a mechanic, you should look like a mechanic. I kind of disagree. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think you ought to look your part for sure. I had a diplomat show up on a primetime show one time in a golf shirt and I almost passed out. Yeah, I was like, no, no, no. You live in a tie. <laughs> like, <laughs> know your part. I love that. <laughs> and maybe if you are a mechanic, maybe yeah, authenticity do your is Zoom from the shop. And That's maybe a good make, idea. Sure there's, make sure there's no grease on your face, but you can mm -hmm. still be in your jumpsuit. But make it look and feel authentic to who and what to do. We also like to double check before our guests arrive. Um, we, we check with the producers ahead of time. Will there be hair? Will there be makeup? And kind of try to avoid that last minute. Oh, will they get to me? Will they not? Um, moment for our clients. And I think that's another layer of confidence for them is something they don't have to worry about. And outside the look, are there any little tips you, you give people to make sure that when they're delivering, they are on point? Because right now I, I'm losing my throat and I feel like you said something, you should always have like a tea or cough dropper. What were some of those thoughts you had? Some tea and some cough drops. And you should always have that because you never know. And when you don't have a cough, you can get one when you're nervous. So that's a good thing. Stay away from carbonated drinks, because if your mic is right here, we're going to hear every bubble that goes up and down your throat. So don't do that. Have some protein for the same reason. We don't want to hear your stomach growling. And then with guys, they love to, you know, cross their leg and all of a sudden they're not in the shot anymore. So sit with your feet flat on the ground, put one in front of the other, keeps you from rocking. You know, there's all sorts of little tips and tricks you can do. One I'll add, one I'll add is I always suggest to lean in, you know, like if you're sitting there and they're always like, oh, man, I like looking, I'm like, just, just lean in just a little bit. <laughs> Make yourself look a little more presentable, right? <laughs> she looks engaged. Yeah. So I feel like summing up some of the points we've made, you know, for those that are listening, you're really looking at who's your audience? Who are the people you're talking to in this interview? What talking points do you need to really make sure that you're getting the value that they're book, booking you for on air? Preparing so that you don't look disheveled, making sure you have a good color scheme going on, a flattering appearance, that your voice is prepped, maybe even doing some vocal exercises and really just preparing so that when you're there, the, the preparation helps alleviate some of the nervousness. And, you know, when we were talking about people who are on camera, you know, everybody here listening, the three of us are not on camera people. We're here to deliver so you can start learning from experts like ourselves. But, <laughs> and I try to say that often because people think that I was an anchor or reporter. And I'm like, and I, like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. <laughs> but <laughs> When you're with people in this environment for so many years, you know, I, I mentioned that Wendy and I both worked at CNN and we were there for about the same length of time, you know, a long time when you're, when you're around these, in, 
this environment and these people, and you're constantly looking at your guests through the lens, you really can provide a strong opinion that will guide and help them. But one of the things that I've always found is that everyone who's on camera, they, they do want to be there, but there's also a lot of handholding. So how do you shape people to kind of get over maybe that imposter syndrome or that, or that confidence hurdle that some people face before they are ready and seasoned? That's a tough one because there's a lot of, I was telling you earlier, I think that people that want to be in the spotlight have a pretty healthy sense of self. They've got a pretty strong ego. But they're also really fragile and they're scared they're going to mess up and they're scared they're going to get this one chance and they're going to blow it. So a lot of our job is cheerleading and pumping them up and helping them prepare for, you know, what's the worst question they could ask and how are you going to answer it? Um, I think if you're prepared for the worst, you're going to be able to sort at the top and deliver the best. So, and, and, you know, there's so many people to, on the confidence front that will be on TV and they constantly are making appearances and they're getting the calls and showing up. Now, what some people don't realize is when you have a legal analyst show up, that doesn't necessarily mean they're being paid to show up. That doesn't necessarily mean that their makeup and hair is being provided in all cases, right? So there are these elements that are assumed available that aren't always there. So how do you navigate that with your guests? The makeup and hair is the trickiest one because the makeup artists at the studio, their first obligation is to the anchors. If there's time, then they do the reporters. Then if there's time, they might touch up the guests. So I always say, come camera ready. And if there's time, they'll touch you up, but don't expect this to be your big makeover moment. Um, it's not going to happen. Yeah. I um, invested in the Dyson Airwrap and I, I, I'm not like sponsored by them in any way, but I highly recommend it because I am able to curl my hair in less than 10 minutes. It's just like boom, boom, boom. So I, Anyone listening, if you're like, oh, I always wind up having to do my own hair, look into it, okay? It's worth the money. <laughs> um, guys, too, like, they don't think that they need makeup. I'm like, you need powder. Oh, they do. Yeah, you definitely do. You definitely, and I always tell the men, go to the, like, the Mac counter at the department store and tell them you're going to be on TV and they'll give you the powder that's right. They know that it's, you know, one shade darker than usual. Your blush is one shade brighter. Like they know what to do at the store. So, but don't go in there bare face because you're going to look sweaty and tired and horrible. So. Amelia, you want to add on to that? It's all about our relationships with the client. And as Wendy said, building them up, just reassuring them along the way that they are meant for this and this is their job and they are exactly where they need to be. So just a lot of reassuring as well. So when you're pitching these guests, how do you get them in front of the others? You know, like many people will say, oh, well, you know, why should I invest in someone like you when, when I could do it myself, right? Can't I just email them? There's a difference. After they try that for a while and they realize <laughs> that's not working. Um, yeah, I, I think most of our clients have tried that and realized it does not work. So it's it's a big job and it's a constant job. You have to just constantly be thinking of the new angle, the new twist, the new show, the new this. It, it's a lot. And it's a lot of a lot of information management. Wendy and myself are constantly on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on all of the socials, kind of stalking our different producers, following them to the different shows they're always going on. So Wendy's been doing this for 22 years. She's grown quite the Rolodex of contacts. And it it's it's very curated and, you know, made with love, but we also sometimes can use other resources such as um, Muckrock is one that we love. And I know there's producers who do this where they will scour just like yourselves, you know, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and look for potential guests that they can make unique to their own show because they're constantly feeding their, their content with maybe the same guests and they want to have a variety, right? 
So it's also good to be putting yourself across multiple platforms and weighing in on the news. So, you know, say, say Amelia is like, okay, these are the stories of the day and you're a client. Maybe you should consider putting yourself out there on all these social media platforms, weighing in on this topic, because that will help when the producer goes to look you up and says, oh, that's right. He, he has a really good point. Let's put him on. I always tell our clients, you can't be a thought leader if no one's following. And I think I think I can even spot a difference between the clients of ours that have a stronger social media presence uh, and between the ones that don't. Um, they're the ones getting more more hits and more media placements because they're more tapped in. And we have plenty of clients that think they don't need it, but the research shows it's very beneficial. <laughs> Yeah. You also can't be a thought leader if you're not putting thoughts out there. You know, like I would pitch guests to my anchor and if they didn't have any strong thoughts on social, it was like, well, are they relevant? Like, oh, well, I mean, I think they are, but maybe you're right. It it it, it just totally deflates the pitch in, in some cases. So I hope anybody listening, and I hope that also helps if, if in case clients are not doing it, they should be. And you need, to, it's unfortunate because of how many platforms we have, but you do need to be creating content for all platforms. You know, you don't want to just be tweeting. Um, video, YouTube shorts, it's its the way to be right now. Yeah. Well, and in all of our pitches, we send out links to the client social, recent clips, the bio, the website, you know, you got to have it. Yeah, I agree. I always loved when people even sent video. I'd be like, oh, <laughs> It's like a present. <laughs> the easier we can make the producer's job, the more the producer will continue coming back for our, our guests and the relationship building. I tell the clients, you got to be the easiest person they worked with all day. If you're a diva, you're not coming back. So, And, and coming back is also a point I wanted to bring up. You know, we've talked about contributorship and some people, they will appear on TV a few handful of times or regularly on a weekend and then start to ask like, well, when am I going to get paid and when can I be a contributor? And they kind of get hooked on this title um, and the payment. And I understand why, you know, you're, you're taking maybe five hours of your day to prepare, to be there and you want to have something for it, but it's usually the exchange of value is like, you're putting yourself out there, you're building your own brand, you're potentially gaining clients. So I think it's a little bit harder for people to gain that contributorship than they realize. Do you have anything you can share on that point? I do. And I think another big thing to remember as, as a guest on the show, the media doesn't owe you anything. They owe you nothing. Just because they had you on one time doesn't mean, oh, now I'm going to be a, a studio regular and I'm going to be on every Monday, Wednesday, Friday for the next year. No, they, if you get, if you get canceled again, it's nothing personal. It's the producers only have so much time in a show that if they have to make a cut, they have to make a cut and it's nothing personal. It's not, Oh, they don't like me or I'm not good enough to be here. Just, I would say the main takeaway is it's not personal, it's business. And if, Something works better for the show. They're gonna they're gonna do what's best for the show. Mm -hmm. And you take it with grace, and you keep moving. <laughs> yeah, I think people have a misconception that most people on TV are getting paid, and it's not true. Most are not getting paid, um, and it depends on so many factors. First of all, you have to be on every single network because if you're only doing one network, why should they pay you? They already have you. So you have to be everywhere and you have to, what our strategy in trying to get someone a contributorship is, is to build that frustration. So the, the producer that used to be able to call you at the last minute and you could run right over anytime, all of a sudden they're hearing somebody else got to you first and oh, so sorry, I'm already booked, can't come. So you build that frustration until somebody says, you know, we really need to put a ring on this person. It's clear they're looking for a home. We better sign them up. So, but even at that point, 
It's how many people do they already have that do what you do? A lot of the anchors have that expertise that, that you might have, and they may not need somebody in that space. If you talk about something that only happens every now and then, why do they need to pay you? <laughs> you know? I mean, like during COVID, I found, you know, those infectious disease doctors that had that expertise were becoming contributors. It's like, to your point, if there's a terrorist attack, the terror experts start to become contributors. It's all about why they need you. Okay. That's it. It's not you. It's like, what's that thing? It's not you. It's them. It's me. It, it really comes down to if it's not the news and you're not going to get it. So if you are talking about COVID and we've moved on and we need lawyers talking about Trump, chances yes. are you're not going to yes. get that contributorship. So as you said, it's business and Amelia and Wendy, you know, your family and you're in this business together. So I just wonder, you know, how does that go? How does that work for the two of you? You don't, you don't work in the same office, you know, you're both at home. So how do you, how do you enjoy working together? And what have you learned from one another? We love it. Um, Wendy, do you love it? Are you still loving it? <laughs> and Absolutely. I think something Wendy and I were talking about earlier was generationally, <laughs> not to show anyone's age or anything, but boomers sometimes will say that millennials are, you know, lazy or entitled or, you know, they're not ready to be hard workers. But I think I would say millennials helped coin the term or, or the phrase um, work smarter, not harder. And Wendy coming from the CNN background of always running around with her head cut off and, you know, always trying to be that scrappy person. I, I love that mentality and I love the hustle of it, but I also think that if there are a little more structure and plans in place, we don't have to do that. And we don't, we don't have to always be chaotic. We can have a plan for when that one thing happens or, you know, we, we just have more of a plan. So I think we, we both, we both learn from each other and grow from each other every day. And it's, it's very fun. It's very fun. So I would love if we could end sharing, you know, some final thoughts that could help people that are looking at trying to put themselves out there and just, even if you're reiterating and just want to perfect their on-camera capabilities, either across social or if they're making a TV appearance. So, and just give us like your three, like final thoughts that could help people. I think just constantly thinking about how you can help the, the viewers of the show and what can you teach them? What can you give them? All of that. And just remember that it's a conversation when you're on, when you're on air with the anchor, it's a conversation. It's not a trick question. They're not trying to trick you and um, just getting comfortable with the uncomfortable and knowing that you are capable and able to do it. Just keep, keep your head held high and you're on the air for a reason. You are the expert. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and on that point, you know, a lot of individuals saying, you know, linear is pulling back, linear is dying. Doesn't mean linear is going, like, it doesn't mean the shows are going away. You know, <laughs> I was watching, you know, CBS news on Alexa and it was not the same as what's on cable. So the, I almost feel like there's more media. Are you guys feeling that? There's absolutely so many different, it's very hard to keep up mm -hmm. with streaming to cable to uh, YouTube shorts to reels to TikToks like you have to be insanely plugged in to keep up with the media because it's forever changing and there are forever new platforms coming about and just staying on top of all of it is a lot to keep up with <laughs> and that's why they have you guys right <laughs> well my favorite is they're often surprised that we get paid for what we do um, imagine that um, and so they'll say things like, well, I don't have any money now, but can I pay you a percentage of my book sales or can I pay you when my product gets off the ground? No, <laughs> that's not how it works. You can't go to Walmart and buy all the ingredients to make a pie and tell the cashier you'll be back when the pies sell. Like it, it does not work that way. So thank you so much for 
joining us and sharing your expertise and everyone listening, just remember, check out the description and there will be a link to their website and more information about our guests and be sure to check them out and follow us, you know, on YouTube as well as on this uh, podcasting platform so that you can get any additional content that may come out after this um, launches. So thank you so much. And um, I'll see you guys online.